Um, when we do release cycles, release cycles are all about managing when we put things in. What we don't want to happen is we don't want a business user to, on Friday, say, hey, I got a great idea. I need it implemented by Wednesday. It doesn't work that way um, because you have to allocate resources appropriately. By developing release cycles, what you can do is you can effectively manage your resources by saying we will do a certain amount of work, say, in a period of a month or two weeks or a week. And what you have is two major components, the inbound, which consists of the critical requirements, and the outbound. The key inbound artifacts are the SRS, System Requirement Specification, and this is basically just a specification document that says this is what I need it to do. The interface control document is all about what systems is it going to interface to, and the non-functional requirements or NFRs are all around, I need it to perform, let's say, sub-second. I need a financial transaction to occur in under one second or in a half a second. Those would be types of non-functional requirements. Uh, that's what uh, this slide basically goes through the release cycle artifacts a little bit more detail, um, provides functional requirements for a given release. The NFR demonstrates the requirements expectations are not part of functionality of the stated request, 25,000 claims per hour. Um, any interface control document provides requirements for interfaces both inbound and outbound. Again, the interface is being, what am I going to interface to? This is a glossary of, uh, of IT terms that need to go in as part of the ITIL framework. The reason this is important is because you have to make sure that everybody is talking about the same thing, that they're all uh, talking about uh, what is a build, that there's no deviation from it. And just having a glossary helps in the communication. That's all we're talking about here. There's nothing more. This is not a rocket science, but where, in what phase is this appropriate? for example, um, and is it required, uh, what is required, what is not required, so that everybody kind of is on the same page and they know what they need to deliver. We also want, as we do release cycles, we want to basically make sure that we are handling some metrics and measures. So, for example, we have a metric called release effectiveness, which, as, a, as an example, contribute to profit or risk mitigation. Um, does it add to the bottom line? Uh, do, do, does this particular release fix a certain issue that's costing us money. So we want to know how much money. We're quantifying each individual release. The productivity matrix uh, index comparative measures of releases to other releases. So let's say one might mean its productivity is average, two is very high, anything less than one is probably not acceptable. <coughs> and the recovery index measures the release of increased value versus bug fixes. So in other words, are we adding value or are we just fixing other things um, that were problematic before. The idea is to tie all the releases together so that we can understand are we ultimately adding value or are we creating more problems. So some of the warning signs in project management was top management informed, uh, were they involved, was the sponsorship, scope creep, all these things are important for project managers to deal with. Uh, hopefully they do it well, but again if they don't that's a, that's a whole other story usually seen in, in failed projects. So in conclusion this is probably the beyond development up until implementation is one of the most important jobs and probably the toughest job because in one case you're preventing an application or functionality from going into production because either it didn't work as required or it's not tested and the applications group may feel resent resentment about it. Um, on the other hand, you're protecting the operations so it's a very strict governance approach saying we're not going to put something in that's going to be faulty, but the business may want it as well, uh, and so you may have security risks and so forth that need to be managed. And these are very, very high personalities. And in some cases, the individuals are very high up in the organization, and they can exert a lot of political pressure. So even with outsourcing and software packages, project management belongs in-house, because you still have to manage these types of functions. Even if I have an outsourced application that comes in, or outsourced developers, the same process has to apply internally. This is not something that you can really outsource because it has to deal with negotiation with business users. Being able to manage these project management skills is absolutely critical. If you're going to successfully implement these things, you have to make sure that all the sponsors and all the stakeholders are totally engaged in this. They understand what the value is, what the risks are, so that as scope creep occurs or as budgetary problems occur, you can bring everybody to the table and come up with a remediation plan. Um, the process of justifying a new system can uncover what's really important to management. In this case, what we're referring to is if we go through the process of trying to justify a new system, management may actually begin telling you where their long-term strategy is. 
This is why architects are very, very important into this discussion because they should already know what management ultimately wants. This should never be a surprise. If you're at the phase where you're in the project management phase of the design, it should have already been clear that this project has some merit to it. The only thing that would cause that to fail is if there is a, a radical change in the environment or if the technology that was required was under underestimated. Uh, that could be another factor. Uh, measuring the benefits afterward helps companies spot benefits they had not originally planned. If you go back once it's implemented and you quantify all your benefits, you may find additional benefits, even intangible benefits, that will actually uh, prove why this project was good and that can be added back in uh, and you can use it as a success criteria for the project. So that concludes Module 10. We'll see you for Module 11, which is all on cybersecurity. Um, soon.